Welcome, everybody. On behalf of the University of California, thank you so much for tuning in today to our UC Alumni Career Network webinar. My name is Jessica Chen, and I am a proud UC San Diego alumni. I'm also the founder and CEO of Soulcast Media, and we are a communications training company. I'm also a Emmy Award winner. Prior to starting Soulcast Media, I was a television journalist working at ABC in San Diego, um, in New York, as well as other cities across the country. So I'm very delighted to be spending this afternoon with you all. I'm going to be moderating today's event. This program is part of the UC-wide effort to unite and support alumni across the 10 campuses. We hope to equip you with insight, knowledge, as well as career opportunities to find a job in the University of California system. So today, our conversation is focused on showing you how you can potentially find a career opportunity at the 10 comp campuses, the five renowned healthcare centers, as well as the three national lab and numerous academic and administrative areas. Today, I am very delighted to be joined by some fantastic UCHR professionals who will be sharing their own insights, personal experiences of what it's like working at the university. So without further ado, I'm very excited to be introducing my panelists who are here today. Tuning in from San Diego is Kim Ayoub, who serves as a Senior Director of Talent Solutions at UC San Diego. Kelly Howard, the Director of Talent Management and Executive Recruitment at UC Office of the President, and she is joining from Oakland, California. And then tuning in from Oakland as well is Nancy Plusdrake, the Executive Director for Human Resources at the UC Office of the President. So I wanna thank my three panelists for taking their time today to join us and share their insights working in the institution. So without further ado, let's kick off today's conversation. And I'm going to ask my panelists to give us a quick introduction of who they are and the work that they do. So let's start off with Nancy here. So Nancy, if you wanted to share a little bit about you and the work that you do. Thank you, Jessica. Um, and thank you everyone for being here. At the UC, I work at the Office of the President. And part of my role is really uh, being responsible for nurturing our employees and helping them in their, and helping them through their career to grow at the office of the president. Um, so I, hand, I manage all of HR and I'm responsible for all of our employees at the office of the president and collaborate with my colleagues, um, other CHROs across the campuses as we look for opportunities for our employees as well. I love that. All right, turning over to Kelly. Kelly, would you like to introduce yourself and the work that you do? Sure. Kelly Howard, uh, I handle talent acquisition and executive staffing for the Office of the President. Um, we handle everything from temporary staffing to professional to executive staff. Um, I've been here um, at the Office of the President for about 10 years now and uh, with the UC system for 17. Um, uh, so that uh, the other well, seven years has been on UC Berkeley campus. So that kind of was my introduction to actually joining higher education. Um, and kind of how I got cooked and haven't let go since then. Uh, I do have several of them that are in my family that live in my house and I send them out to UC every day as well as myself. And so I'm excited to be here with that. Um, I've been uh, collaborating with folks across the system um, for a number of years. And so we've been putting in some really good talent programs um, and things that um, for talking with folks who like to work with the university. Ellie, we're so excited to have you here. And finally, Kim, if you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the work that you do. Thank you. So, yes, um, I'm Kim Ayub, Senior Director of Talent Solutions at UC San Diego. Um, I started my first position at Temporary Employment Services at UCSD. I've been working for the university now for 34 years. I started off working off in a couple of short-term assignments and then was assigned to fill in for a staff member that was actually out on vacation for in the temporary employment service office. And um, I must have left a good impression because I was requested to come back and fill in when that employee gave notice a couple months later and was encouraged to apply for the position and then hired full time into an administrative role. Um, at that time, temporary employment services was a small service managed by two team members. 
myself and the manager of the program supporting departments with their immediate temporary staffing needs. After demonstrating my strong work ethic and leadership skills, I was promoted into the manager role. And across a span of years, I've since added new services, including career float polls, executive recruitment services, a candidate sorting scene service, implemented a screening service to include life scam background checks, reference checks, and more. And as Senior Director of Talent Solutions, I now oversee talent acquisition as well. I am responsible for managing over 30 staff members and over 400 TS employees and managing a budget of over $25 million. So really went from going from that entry-level position into this level position. This topic is important to me because I'm always excited to share my experience of working my way up from an entry-level position as a TS employee to the position that I now hold as Senior Director. So thank you. Thank you, Kim. So for those who are joining and listening in right now, I want to let everybody know. So we have a few questions that we are going to be asking our panelists, but we want to let you know that this event is very much for you, too. So if you have any questions for any of our panelists, there is a Q and chat box on Zoom right now, and that's where you can type in your questions because we will leave about 15 or so minutes at the end to answer any questions that you have. But let's kick off with some of the questions that we have for our panelists. And I'm going to start this question by having Kelly answer this. And so this is the first question that I have. So what type of career opportunities are available at the University of California? And how can job seekers learn more about these opportunities? It's interesting, though, Kelly, because I feel like for many of us who graduate right from a UC system, we might think, okay, where can we look? But actually, there actually might be opportunities in the system that we've graduated from. So Kelly, where and how can people learn about these opportunities? Yeah, Um, that's a really good point. I mean, all of you guys that are listening in all come from a UC, right? So you understand what those little cities are that you graduated from, um, you know, as far as the job opportunities and the different people that actually work there. And so one of the things I'd like to, to, to talk about is from a UC perspective, you kind of have to take a step back and kind of understand how big UC actually is, right? Um, I think coming from the Berkeley campus, I knew all that I needed to know about Berkeley. And then I came to the office of the president and realized, wow, like there are 10 campuses and five healthcare centers and three labs. And I got to play a part in a lot of different firing that took place in all of those, those areas. Um, one of the big things um, I, I want to mention is that, you know, UC PATH was, uh, is a place that we pay all the folks that work for, for UC. There's 232,000 people who get paid from for the University of California. So we're one of the third largest employers in the state of California. That's a huge impact that UC has across California from north to south, right? And so um, that means there's a lot of opportunities within, within um, UC. One of the things that I think that's important to understand, a lot of folks do think that there are professor uh, professor positions, research positions. They don't really kind of understand that there's other jobs that are here that are a massive across. Like 70% of actually um, the workforce uh, are non-academic that work for the University of California. So that's a lot of folks that are working for, for Cal or for UC in general across California. Um, in that in that particular number of individuals, it also says that, you know, six uh, six out of 10 UC staff work for a healthcare system, right, within within California uh, for UC. And so that's a huge number that we're actually looking at. You know, in those particular groups that we're looking at, we're looking at everything uh, from health services, student services, uh, research support, compliance, general administration. Those are all opportunities at every single one of the UCs that you can take a look at as far as how do you build your career. Um, You know, one of the things I think that's important to understand is like, how do you go about finding those opportunities? Because we are so large, um, every, we have a system-wide job board that actually has all of the jobs posted across the entire system. So that's the 10 campuses and 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 the healthcare systems, as well as the labs. It gets posted if you go to the UCOP website, our website, um, you can find a little tab that says jobs there and you click into that and you can use keywords to find all opportunities that you're looking for. The other piece, as far as the 30% of folks that, that are actually in uh, academia, they also have a website called uh, iRecruit or Recruit. And you can go and click into that and it'll show you every single opportunity that's there and it's posted. 
um, what things are required for those jobs, and then kind of what their next steps are. So those are where you go find the jobs, right? Um, but the important piece to understand in looking for a job, we're a huge organization. Um, and so you can't just go to a job board and just find your job and think you're going to apply to it because Kim and I, we can tell you, we get thousands and thousands of applications every year, right? And so working with those individual hiring managers and those teams to find that individual, it, it takes a lot of work. But it takes a lot of work on, on your part too. You can network with MUC. And to your point, Jessica, as you mentioned, you can network in the areas that you came on. You can t attend professional organizations, career fairs. You can, t you can um, tap into where you actually graduated from to see what opportunities that you have, get to know the people, get to know the recruiters. Networking is super important in that aspect and being able to find whatever your next job is, whether it's at UC or anyone else, right? Um, the, the final thing I wanted to say as far as understanding that professional development and where you are in that, LinkedIn and social media is also another place that we can connect um, into folks at UC as well as across uh, the different campuses. Um, and one of the things I think I've looked in to see you guys as alum, there's a lot of alum that are on LinkedIn uh, right now. And so that's a good, great network um, to, to build, you know, um, to, build your, to build your network and see what's next at the University of California. I want to highlight the LinkedIn aspect, Kelly, because LinkedIn, and I'm sure a lot of us use LinkedIn as a place just to post our job experience or where we graduated. But LinkedIn, I would actually agree with you, is a very robust platform to actually get your name, get your experience out there. And just to rehash some of your point, Kelly, I thought it was really interesting that you said that there's actually a lot of non-academic jobs because people often think, oh, if you're working for an education, institution, it's probably only education based, but there's probably a lot of other ones that you mentioned. You also said if folks want to look for jobs, go to the UCOP website as well as iRecruit. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, that's correct. So let's, let's turn over to Kim because Kim, I want to get your thoughts on this question as well. So if folks are looking for career opportunities, where and how can they go about this? Yeah, absolutely. So specific to UC San Diego, we currently have several opportunities available um, in accounting and financial positions. You know, and as Kelly mentioned, as you also, Jessica mentioned, really important that as a learning institution, we want to make sure that job seekers understand that UCSD hires for a variety of staffing needs and positions at every level, not only pertaining to education or teaching. And we had a hiring campaign that we had um, previously launched that really prefaced this. So currently the uh, positions that we have available are accounting and financial positions, facility maintenance and trades, hospitality and food service, information technology, health, patient care, nurses, physician, pharmacists. Those right now are our hot jobs that we're really looking to attract and uh, retain uh, staff for those positions. We also offer other career opportunities within student services, event coordination, marketing and media, um, and then administrative entry level support up to executive and management positions, many more. Um, for UC San Diego specifically, I encourage job seekers to create an employment profile for UC San Diego, which can be accessed on the employment.ucsd.edu or jobs.ucsd.edu website. You can set up your profile and immediately apply for positions or apply later if you prefer. Set up the profile and come back. We have new features in the application center, such as the capability to customize cover le letters and resumes, check your application status, and bookmark jobs and the, the ability to create and save job searches and even to get email updates for new jobs as they post. I want to turn this over to Nancy to see, do you have any thoughts on career opportunities that you can share with our audience too? Sure, thanks. I, I wanted to build on something that both Kelly and Ken said. The UC system is a huge ecosystem when you think about the opportunities of uh, career growth. And so I think that one thing that is important for candidates to think about is not only the campus that you might be looking at, but the potential long-term growth that you might have and the ability to move around to different locations um, and get different experiences and not just, not just keep your eyes focused on a singular campus if you have ideas to grow in other places where maybe that campus may not have those opportunities, but other locations do, because we really do like to move UC folks around to different campuses to help them grow their careers. And so I think that 
that's a really important point to think about is there's a, there's opportunity to have a nice, uh, successful long-term career and, and have variety by moving to different locations, our labs, our, our medical centers, and our campus locations. And what I found really reassuring just hearing the three of you speak is there's actually roles for any level, whether you just graduated from a university or you've been working for 10, 20, perhaps even 30 years. And what I love about it is there's so much movement too within once you're in the organization. So the second question, this one's actually for Kelly. What are the typical requirements of these job positions? And I know this is a very broad question because I'm sure it really depends on the role. But in general, what do you see are the typical requirements? Yeah. So, you know, in general, um, I was thinking about career counts is what you were going to ask me. <laughs> um, in general, as far as the requirements go, it depends on what the job actually is, right? Um, and what their hiring manager is looking for as far as um, the 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 actual thing that the job is doing, right? And so many of us graduated from UC in one particular, maybe we're in healthcare, maybe we're in student services. Um, they're different or, or accounting or finance or that sort of thing. So when you take a look at those jobs, the job descriptions that are posted for all jobs, they kind of give the requirements that we're looking for, for all of that. In general, if I'm thinking about, you know, requirements for the jobs that go across, for the academic side of the house, most of those do require a PhD, they require research, they require publishing, um, all of those things, a teaching experience, all of those things are, are for the academic side of the house. And when you go to those job descriptions, you'll see those requirements there. The other positions that are the non-academic positions for healthcare, of course, there's like making sure that you um, are certified, you have the experience, you have the education for a lot of those different positions from doctors, nurses, allied health, all of those things. Um, healthcare is um, has been critical during this time of COVID and coming out of COVID and UC has been remarkable. So taking a look at what those requirements are, are important. And then, you know, as far as the, uh, the other positions, a lot of them do require some education or a number of years of experience in those particular fields of me and animals. So for in student services, for instance, a lot of those require bachelor's or a master's degree. They require working around students, um, setting up programming and that sort of thing. Um, so there are different requirements for all of those types of jobs. Um, when you look at, you kind of broke it into like, entry level versus, you know, mid-career versus executive level, the jobs really are set up that way within the job fields and families. So across the UC, a lot of the SAC jobs fall into something that's called career tracks. And in that career tracks program, it shows you, you know, where can you come in with a certain, certain level of, of, of experience. So maybe zero to three years is just coming out of school that you're looking for an opportunity. And then, you know, as you move and gain more experience within UC, those other jobs require like three to five years experience, right? Um, and you really are looking at what have you tackled, what have you experienced, what have you accomplished in those jobs. And you kind of move them on and take them on to a higher level position. Kind of as you look at LinkedIn, I went through and kind of take a look at all of our um, experience and requirements that we put in. and. I won't go into a whole lot of detail, but I can see among the alumni and the folks that work at UC, they gradually gain and gain folks in higher level positions and experience. Um, that is one way that you can you can grow within UC, but also you can go across the lattice as well. So sometimes you may not want to go up, you can go across and you can experience um, different types of careers in, uh, in other, other job fields and families. It's so, it's to me, just kind of hearing that it kind of really just shows that there's just so many ways to enter the system. And once you're in the system, there's so many ways to grow with it, which is fantastic. So Kim, the question that I have for you specifically pertains to entry level position. So can you describe the typical career path for somebody who maybe just graduated not too long ago? So a typical career path for someone starting out in an entry level position can vary depending on the position, field, and individual's goals. However, there are some general steps that can be taken. Entry level positions such as a research assistant, administrative assistant, or lab technician, let's say, can gain valuable experience and skills in their role. They may also work with a mentor or a supervisor who can, who can guide them in their career. As the employee gains more experience and becomes more knowledgeable about the university and its operations, they may choose to specialize in a particular area. 
And this may be involved pursuing additional education or training in a related field or participating in professional development courses or programs offered at their UC campus or system wide. Um, you know, I had mentioned I started in the temporary employment pool. I think that if somebody is looking like a recent um, graduate or um, somebody who's not currently in a career position, taking advantage of that program is really beneficial because you have an opportunity to go into these positions and really learn, not only gain the experience and the skills um, of that particular position and get some training, but also really determining whether that's a position you want to pursue and continue. So lots of different things to take advantage of, but I definitely recommend temporary employment services. I think sometimes there's a little bit of a negative connotation. People are like, no, I want a career job. I don't want a temp job. But um, we see such a high turnover uh, or transition rate of these temporary employees moving into career positions. And it's also a great way to get transferable skills. So, you know, you may be looking, you may have accounting background, but may have an interest in research administration. And there may be some transferable skills there that you can apply to those roles. So really looking at that and making sure you have that on your resume those are all really helpful in terms of trying to make your way up and work yourself into uh, higher level positions. That's so great, actually, when you mentioned this, the opportunity to work in a temporary role as a way for you to also kind of get a taste, right? Like, is this actually what I want to do versus committing yourself to a full time role where maybe it might not be the best fit? So I love what you said, Kim, about being open minded to also searching for temporary jobs as a way to educate yourself in whether or not this is the right opportunity. So Nancy, I want to turn to you because I have a question and I'm very curious to get your thoughts on this. So can you tell us about any unique or innovative programs or initiatives in the University of California that helps support employees in their career growth and development? Yeah, I think um, it's great because being a higher education institution, where we're certainly focused externally, it's important to know that we do focus very internally on our employees as well. And so some of the things that we've done across the system are management certificate programs where we help uh, help folks who are going into management programs to really be prepared to be managers in their roles. And so there is a, there is a, a system-wide program where all of our campuses can participate in that and our employees can gain a management certificate. We also partner with Coro across um, UC, both in Southern and Northern California. And Coro, for those of you that may not know, is a is a uh, nonprofit organization that does leadership development. And they we do annually a program where uh, folks are nominated to be participate in those cohorts, and they get to work with many colleagues across the campus locations, including faculty and staff, on a UC. Um, issue that we may want to solve or we want to get creative and innovative with, and they bring forth recommendations that usually the UC will adopt. And so they get to be part of a group that really gets to impact the university and what we're trying to do. Other things that we do is obviously we do have technical training. We also have a program called YUC um, that helps an employee map their career growth. So they can actually work with their HR partner or their manager and look at different uh, things that they want to do and then help them build their development plans to, to move forward with that. And, and then again, from a pers perspective of areas where there may be technical skills that we might not develop internally, we support our staff in going external to ensure that they're growing in their fields and they're getting the development that they need. That's fantastic. And it's great to hear that it's not just once a person starts working that that's the end, right? It's once you're in, we're having various ways to help you grow individually as well as professionally. So that's fantastic. Uh, Kelly, this is another question for you as we kind of pivot a little bit. So I'm curious, when somebody applies for a job, what qualities and skills are most valued in the hiring process? So if somebody is putting together their resume, perhaps getting interviewed now, what are the skills that they should highlight during their interview process? Yeah, one of the things we, we my team, we hire hundreds, hundreds of people every year. And so one of the things that is really key for this hiring manager is they are looking at those requirements. They, they'll have tons of responsibilities and things that they want you to do, but they're really looking at the requirements that they put on that job description. And so one of the things I always like to encourage folks to do as they're getting ready and prepping for interviews is to take a look at what's required. Take a look at where your skill set actually funds in and matches. 
for whatever that particular job is that you're recruiting for uh, or that you're applying for? And then also, how do you have transferable skills? Kim's mentioned that a little bit. And how does that plug into that particular job? So the hiring managers are really looking for um, some transferable skills and some solid skills across um, all of the jobs. So if I go and I look at all the positions that we interview for, and we are constantly looking at skill sets, they are specific to whatever that particular group is, uh, finance, uh, student services, HR, all of that. But also there's some key competencies that I think that not only apply to you see, but across many different jobs, right? So critical thinking skills are really key for the university, um, coming in at all levels and being able to um, tackle problems and issues um, that we are faced within the organization. Um, collaboration and teamwork um, is super important, um, not only because um, we are working internally, as Nancy said, but also externally across the different campuses for many different jobs um, that we're looking at. Service-oriented technology and digital literacy is super important, um, and how we use that in our day-to-day -day, um, work here at the university. And then, you know, one of the key things that I find in every single job is um, the commitment to diversity for the candidate. That's a big uh, piece for the University of California. We are asking candidates that all the time um, and their commitment to diversity um, and um, being able to articulate that and, and share that here. The other important piece I think that um, experience-wise that they're looking at is being able to um, resonate with the mission of the University of California. Whether you're working directly on that mission or whether you're in a support capacity in some other job, as we work through everything um, at the university, you will find that you touch that mission in many different ways. Um, and uh, we're working directly on it, or working, you know, supporting someone. Um, they do ask that question. It comes out as we talk to people, and so that's one of the key things that managers do look for: um, that is this is the right next for you. It reminds me, so so the work that we do here at Soulcast Media, so we're a communications training company, so we help folks with communications, and we get a lot of folks asking us about the interviewing, the interviewing process, how do they showcase themselves, and it just reminds me of one of the things that we always share with folks is, yes, before you jump into your interview, read that job description, make note of the key words that are in that job description so that when you're in the interview process, you are actually saying those words too, because a person hiring you wants to know that you understand the role and also the experience that you have is relevant to it. So preparing, practicing is so important. So before we uh, jump into our next question, which is gonna be for you, Kim, I just wanna give everybody a quick reminder. If you have any questions, please put it into the chat function, I, uh, in the Q&A function. I do see a lot of the questions coming in, so keep them coming because we are soon going to be opening it up to answer the questions that we're receiving. So, Kim, this next question is for you. What resources are available to help employees identify and pursue career advancement opportunities at the University of California? Yes, yeah, so this question is similar, I think, to the question that Nancy answered talking about UC system-wide um, you know, programs that are offered and opportunities for advancement. So um, as she mentioned, just system-wide My UC career is available to all UC faculty, academic personnel, staff, and students seeking to advance their careers. And um, this is an online developmental portal that offers six self-paced modules to help employees discover their internal UC career mobility options. Um, she also talked about UC Coro system-wide leadership collaborative program, which is available to assist the UC managers and supervisors to retain and advance um, high performing and high potential staff. And then one other thing, I know this was a program that I participated in, which, which was the UC Women's Initiative for Professional Development program, which supports the success and advancement of mid-career women-identified professionals. So those are, to name a few, several other opportunities available that certainly um, people can explore. Specific to UC San Diego, we also offer advancement and career development opportunities for employees, one being a program called Career Connection. This program is sponsored by UC San Diego Human Resources and provides employees with assistance with career planning, job enhancement, and lateral or upward mobility. We also offer career, de career development workshops, staff mentorships, career consultation, resume assistance, mock interviews, and more. Um, UCSD also has a staff promotion program that supports employee career advancement and provides additional flexibility for employee mobility. 
That's fantastic. And it's so great to hear that, one, again, once you're in the system, there are so many resources to also help as well. So as we wrap up um, our questions, this last one goes to Nancy. And again, please throw any of the questions that you might have in the Q&A box. So Nancy, tell us about any unique benefits or perks offered to University of California employees and how might this differ from, from different campuses? Sure. I, I think that, um, you know, we have a long legacy and history, of, not only as, um, you know, as an education um, provider for the community, but we also, um, you know, are the third largest employer in the state of California. Um, and all of us know that this is the fifth economy in the world. And so we're contributing a great deal to, to California. So when I think about um, the, the university and what is unique and different, you know, I think aside from the traditional benefits that we, we provide that, are, you know, expected um, by everybody, I think about the mission and how important the mission is and why, if you're working here, you're contributing and thinking about contributing to the fifth largest economy in the world, right? And so we're participating in that. I think the other thing is we've learned some things during the pandemic as well about things that we need to do differently and to change differently. And so we've really focused a lot on at our campus locations, at the office of the president, um, the health centers as well in, in staff positions is looking at how we can provide a little bit more flexibility to really key on that work-life balance for our employees. I think I know that when I joined UC seven years ago, work work uh, play, work balance, work life balance was a really a big thing. And I think that, you know, we learned a lot during the pandemic. A lot of us didn't have that. And it was really important to get back to that. The other thing is we do have wellness programs across our system to really focus on how we can help um, our staff and really and, and faculty to really make sure that they are caring for themselves and making sure that they are in the best place that they can be so that they can be the best for the jobs that they're doing. And so I think that, that those are really some, some really key things because we're very focused on the whole person. We're really, we, you know, I think historically, you know, we uh, were part of an organization as in, employees and, you know, we, we did our jobs and the employee and the university really appreciated so many of us. But now we're thinking about what are other things that all of our employees think about, you know, their parents, their children, uh, their spouses, um, you know, different challenges that people have that they have to balance. And so we're paying attention to those things. I think the other really big thing for us is the collegial environment that we work in. You, If you work for UC, you have the opportunity to work with some of the smartest, uh, innovative people in the world. And there are many places that you get to really say that, you, that that's an opportunity that you get to have. And I know in my seven years, I have met so many people that have done so many incredible things um, in the world that um, it really just makes me really proud to, to be a UC employee. Gosh, you know, it's so inspiring to hear the three of you share all this, because for anybody who's ever considered a career in the University of California, I just feel having this conversation is like, please sign me up. I want a job at the UC system. So this is fantastic. So now we're going to pivot to some of the great questions that we've received. By the way, we've, we've received so many questions from our audience. So we're going to do our best to filter through um, them. But the first one that I want to get to is this question, and I'm actually going to open it up to the three of you. And Kelly, I'm actually going to start with you. So this question is about remote work. Now, a lot of us have you know, the desire to perhaps work remotely. And as Nancy mentioned, sometimes they can help with that work-life balance a little bit. So um, Kelly, starting with you, what are the remote opportunities? And um, is it possible for people who don't even live in California to work for the UC system? Who sends that question to me? Thank you, uh, Jessica. Um, <laughs> remote, actually, a lot of the positions that we have uh, that are remote work positions are within the IT field. Um, and so a lot of those opportunities are remote. They are remote within California. Um, and so that's the way that we recruit um, for those jobs. If there are other positions that are remote within our organization, um, we do identify them as, as remote right off the bat. And so we talk about when you'll have to um, connect with your teams uh, in person. So there is some of that for remote work. Um, one of the things I think that has been really, really um, an enormous change for, for us as an organization during the pandemic is that 
I got to meet so many colleagues that were from Southern California, right? They were able to work with us day to day. And I would never have been able, I mean, I might have talked to them, but to explore and have them bring their knowledge to our organization here has been really um, inspirational and really, really um, very valued as far as, as that's concerned. And I don't know if Nancy or, or Kim, if you guys also have remote opportunities that you um, have identified in the org. Yeah, Kim. Yeah, so we actually um, do have, and I think similar to what you said, Kelly, a lot in our IT and really looking at positions that focus on, you know, can the work be done at home? Like, do the do we have to have people actually coming into the office to complete this? So we are taking a look at more of the positions that are available and can we offer those opportunities? Um, also, hybrid um, schedules is something that we have offered. And, you know, that really has helped even kind of expand our you know, candidate base. So those people who maybe may live outside of San Diego County, if you're only coming into the office one day a week, we're able to attract those candidates as well and be able to offer that uh, flexibility and being able to work, you know, four days from home and then one day in the office. So um, we, it's been um, something that in human resources, we've really been supportive and wanting to reach out to departments and have them open up some departments that are a little bit shy of wanting to kind of release that remote um, flexibility entirely having somebody work outside of the office. But I see things that with the pandemic and as we've seen, people have really been able to get work done, right? I almost feel sometimes you work harder when you're working remote. And so I think that is resonating across with department supervisors and managers. And, and we're seeing more department supportive of this. That's great. Nancy, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, I think the only thing that I would add is if there was an outcome that was positive from the pandemic, this was flexibility was the outcome that came out of that. Um, I think the other thing is we're going to continue to evolve and learn um, like other organizations, right? This is new for all of us. And that's, I think, our commitment is to, to continuing to look and study what we're doing and understand what other sets are doing so that we can create the best environment for our employees. So the next question that we have from an audience member is, it has to do with recruiters and how they can get connected to recruiters. And I often think of recruiters as the gatekeepers in many ways, right? It's like you have to get connected to one because that's how they can see you, review your resume. So uh, Kim, why don't we start with you first for this question? So what is the best way for someone to get started and connected with a recruiter to get a job? So I think um, the first steps are obviously what we talked about is getting into, you know, the jobs website, submitting your resume and application and um, applying for the position. Um, our recruiters are involved in a lot of the outreach efforts as well. So we're at job fairs. A lot of times the recruiters are there participating in conversations and wanting to communicate with the candidates. Um, LinkedIn, there's an opportunity with our recruiters that are on LinkedIn advertising positions that they're specifically posting for. Um, as Kelly mentioned previously in one of the questions, we are receiving thousands and thousands of resumes and applications and inquiries about positions. But I think LinkedIn is definitely um, a way to be able to connect and reach out to um, a recruiter, especially with our executive recruitment services, where we are really looking at providing searches for specific positions and reaching out to candidates and having those conversations. So making connect a connection on LinkedIn is always something that I recommend. Kelly, do you have any thoughts on this? Because, yeah, it's like you're seeing so many resumes every single day. Yeah, I think um, being connected and kind of knowing where the recruiters are going out. Um, for instance, we're going out to Houston Riverside <laughs> um, this week. Um, but there. Um, but also recruiters are on the deep den. And it is a direct, you can, it's like you're sitting in someone's, you know, computer and you're just pinging them to say, me, I saw this opportunity. Um, and I might be interested in it. Would it be okay for me to apply whatever? And sometimes recruiters will be able to apply directly to you there. Um, of course, now my team's going to be like, oh my God, you said all of those alumni to me through through LinkedIn, but that's a good thing. So um, and I do think that and the recruiters are very connected also across the system. So sometimes when there are opportunities that uh, we have in our shop, we'll share them with the whole recruiting, recruiting teams across the system. And so we do have networks that we, can connect with. So um, connecting with a recruiter is, a, is an important thing and a good thing. I love that. And I love that you mentioned that even amongst recruiters, if there's a fantastic candidate, but there might not be a fit in that particular role, that the recruiters will also talk amongst themselves too, to be like, hey, you need to check out this, this candidate. Nancy, do you have anything to add about getting connected to recruiters who I call the gatekeepers? <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, the other piece I would add is all of us in leadership, I consider recruiters because we are always on the lookout for great talent. And so I think that if you, you know, run into someone or you have an interest in, you know, pay perhaps a position that they may have, um, we all like to talk about our jobs as well. And so reach out and just connect with someone because we can always put you in contact with a recruiter or talk about the opportunities that are available at BUC. So I think that's another way. The word that you mentioned that I want to highlight is the word connect, right? And I think it really does require, regardless of if you just graduated or you've been working for many years, it's all about the people who you can engage with. And it's not necessarily just, hey, can you get me this job, right? It's just, can I get to know you? Can you tell me about your experience? Developing that relationship is truly so critical. So I want to pivot to another question. Nancy, I actually want to start with you for this question. So this question has to do with people who might have worked, but paused, took a break, maybe have not worked for a few years and now want to get back into the workforce and want a job in the UC or higher education. So do you have any tips for folks who might have paused in their career? Sure. Um, yeah, you must have looked at my background, Jessica, because I paused for a couple of years. Um, I had that great opportunity to take a couple of years off. And you always worry when you make that decision, what is that going to mean to you in the future? I think the world has changed. Um, I think, uh, you know, in, in my early career, I probably might not have been as daring to do that because I don't think employers looked upon gaps as, as, as positive things. But there are real reasons in people's lives why they take gaps. Um, some people take gaps to do something different. Some people take gaps because they need to do things with their family. Some people just need a break and they have the opportunity where they can do that. And they are taking time to determine what might be their next step. For me, I came out of the corporate world and I really wanted a break. And I had to decide what, what was my next opportunity and what was I going to do? And just dumping into another job did not make any sense for me. I wanted to make sure I got the right fit. And that's when I decided to go into higher education because I, I said, well, you know, I want to go into higher education because that's where we really help people and we change lives. And I want I want my role, not that I didn't work for great companies on the private sector side and, and, and um, in the non, you know, higher education side of things, but, it, but I now was wanting to be very mission driven. So had I not taken that gap, I might have ended up in a job I might not have liked simply to take a job. So I think what's really important is, is to simply just be able to explain your gap, you know, and I think we are much more um, understanding and recognize that people take gaps for and gap times in their career. And it's really OK. It's really OK. And actually, I resonate with that, too, because when I started my career after I graduated UC San Diego, I, I started as a journalist. Uh, I worked in TV. But then I took about a year gap before I started my own company, because just like you, Nancy, I was really trying to be intentional and being really intentional of like, what is it that I want to do? Because if you're going to commit to the next job, you really do want to commit for at least the next few years. Kelly, what are your thoughts on this question for those who maybe they do feel a bit discouraged because they're like, oh, it is hard now to get a job because I have that gap. Any tips for those those folks? Very similar to what we both just said. You know, there's there, you know, when we train recruiters, we always train them to say, okay, what was your next step? And then what else did you do in the last few years? And if there is a gap, they will ask, right? They're like, oh, I noticed from here to here there was a gap. And so you do need to be able to explain, hey, what is that gap? Why do you have that gap? And and everything that you both said is absolutely okay, right? Um, I think, you know, when I first bought into recruiting um, after 9-11, Every single resume had this gap, right? Because the economy working was all strange and it was weird to say that we're all connected by this gap, right? And so the gap is is just something that um, that you need to do for yourself, right? Uh, a job is important, um, but um, a job is not your life, right? And so you work to live. Um, but, you know, I think that it's okay to do that. Just, you know, that you, you know, someone we will ask about it and kind of have, you know, what you did and what you're comfortable with sharing. And to add on that, I would say during the interview process, it's okay to, you know, you should talk about that, but I wouldn't necessarily say you have to focus on talking about that gap, right? You can mention why you took that, but then now link what you did do with the position that you want now. Kim, do you have any thoughts on when you're, you know, talking to applicants and you do see folks who have that gap? Do you have any tips for them? 
Yeah, actually, um, I would uh, let them know that the cover letter is also something that is really useful for them to kind of, you know, explain, you know, what they've been doing in, you know, the reason for the gap, as Kelly mentioned, it's really important because sometimes you're wondering, okay, you know, was that person just kind of in a st stale mode? But if there's things that you were doing, um, even social activities where you are working with an organization or volunteering or doing different types of adding that information in, which may have those transferable skill sets, they can bridge that gap in, in order to move into a position. So cover letters are always really good. We read those, the recruiters are reading those and um, may answer any questions that they have in their mind about what they're looking at in the resume. So that would be my advice. I'm always on, because I know there's always a debate, cover letters or no cover letters, because that can be time consuming to write it, right? But I do think of cover letters as a way to connect with the person who is actually reviewing it. Your cover letter is actually an opportunity to showcase even a little bit more of your personality that you can't necessarily get in a bulleted resume. So the next question I have, this one is more for uh, Kelly and Kim, actually. So this is for the folks who just graduated, the folks who just graduated from one of the UC uh, universities. And you both mentioned this temporary job as a way into the system. Can you just explain a little bit more about how this actually can be a good thing? And why don't we start with Kelly? Um, can you just elaborate a little bit more about this temporary job as a way in? Yeah. So we several of the UCs do have temporary programs that um, that are set up for folks to come in anywhere from 30 days to a year to two years and, and a temporary opportunity. Um, a lot of times they used to just be like mostly just administrative jobs um, that were coming in. Um, there are a lot of those that you can that are entry level type of positions, but then there's these very unique kind of projects that, that are happening at the university and they'll want to bring temporary staff on board to help with those projects in many different ways. Um, the the temporary staffing is a program. You do get benefits within the university and, and are those programs, but we also do some little bit of contract hiring as well. So those projects that come in that we are working on that are critical to our business at whatever time, you can come in and get some really good skills and an experience within UC. It's always like, hey, this is my step into UC. It's a good way to see what UC is about, how it operates, um, and then how you can start to think about how do you, if you work like it, how do you continue that on, right? Um, and moving into a career position. So Kim talked a lot about what that transition rate looks like of moving in from a temp to a career. And I will say that um, our previous executive director of human resources came in as a temp from UC Berkeley and did phenomenal. And so there, there is, there's growth and there is um, things that you take on uh, that you learn about and you see that really also make the next step. Sometimes I feel like actually starting as a temp is a great way for you to also even meet more people that you might not necessarily get to meet if you are in a full-time role. Because sometimes if you're in a full-time role, that's all you're doing within that group, right? Or that department. But something about being temp allows you to get to know more people. Kim, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I think it was a really important point that Kelly made that, you know, the temples are not just entry level, you know, for entry level positions. We really are having departments leaning on the temporary employment pool program for their immediate staffing needs in all levels of positions. And so a lot of times we're, we may, um, for UC San Diego, we have kind of a blanket uh, posting for people who are interested in coming into the temp pool, but we will also post specific, specific uh, jobs for some of these higher level positions. So um, really encourage folks because a lot of times departments don't have the funding right away to be able to create an FTE. So they're looking to get somebody into support as a temporary while they're working on putting that job together and getting the job classified, classified and posted. And obviously the person that's already there doing the job on a temporary basis has already been trained as the skill set, you know, is going to have the advantage um, and um, when recruiting for that position. So again, just echoing Kelly's comments on um, on it's not just entry level. We're looking at all different levels and it's a great way to get your foot in the door. I go to so many different uh, speaking engagements and I always start off with the question, Does it, is anybody familiar with the temporary employment pool? How many people actually were in the temporary employment pool um, and started their career? And I am blown away by the number of hands that I get 
um, and the amount of people that come up to me with their success stories. I started as a temp and I'm fired. Now I'm in my dream job. So really, I can't stress how um, I think that that's such a great way to get your foot in the door, gain the skills and experience that uh, departments are looking for and to be able to move and advance within your career at the UC. Right. And I think kind of like the underlying message here is, you know, starting as a temp is just as valuable as starting full time too, right? It's just another way. And one other thing I will say, sorry, just really quickly, as a TES employee, you are a UC employee. And so when you're applying for positions, you have the advantage of applying as an internal candidate. So really important to know that that is just another advantage for getting into those positions. Because sometimes these postings will look at internal candidates first before looking at external. So huge advantage to be able to get your foot in the door and have that opportunity to be reviewed and screened and interviewed first. That's actually a really good point, because I think for for a lot of folks who might be job searching right now, it can feel very discouraging that you're applying to these full-time jobs. Nobody, you're not getting a call back, but you're saying maybe a strategic way is starting temp, and then now you're internal, and then your resume might be reviewed first now when you apply for that full-time job. So pivoting topics a little bit, and Nancy, I'm going to start with you for this question. This has to do with UC's commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion. So I'm just curious to get your thoughts on what are, when people think about, you know, age or like, you know, things like that, how how does UC view this in terms of making sure that they have that diversity in hiring? Sure. I think one important point to recognize is we have seven generations in the workforce working at UC. So we have a lot of diversity in generations and i think that adds a lot of different perspectives and you know looks at how we do different things um in the workplace i think the other piece is we've really looked at our hiring processes and looked at how we ensure that member man, hiring managers are are trained in diversity equity inclusion and selection process and they're you know and, and starting to recognize what any of their biases could be, any all of us have biases. And I think it's just part of it is just being aware that we have those biases and when they come out, right? And then for jobs that have committees, um, the whole committee is required to be trained in DEI, um, IRE practices, because we really want to be sure that, you know, our teams are looking at that. And then depending, I know on the, on the academic side, the academics have equity advisors, on the staff side, um, so those folks are really involved in making sure that there are no, you know, situations that come up that may compromise um, DEI in the interview process. Um, and then on the staff side, we're looking at doing a similar thing by adding equity advisors as well to help in that process. Because again, you know, I think that we're really working with the hiring committees to make sure that you know our personal biases don't come out. Um, and you have to be really mindful of those things. In different situations, I know at the Office of the President, and I think some of my colleagues have talked about this, we also go through and vet resumes by redacting names, by redacting university, uh, you know, where people got their education. People have biases to people's education as well. And so that we're then just having people look at, does this, does this candidate meet the qualification of the job? And they're not having any some of the things that might be biases that we might not think have a negative could and have a negative impact on the recruitment process. And so we do do that for um, some jobs at the office of the president as well to help with that process. So um, I think we're very committed and continue to look at you know how we can really make sure that our hiring managers are aware and, and that we're helping them. I love that. So I just want to share that we have about a few minutes left before the and before we conclude this event. And, you know, it's just so fantastic to hear the insight from our three fantastic panelists. But I want to make sure to get to these last few questions. And this is these are more tactical questions, actually, that I want to open to my panel. So the first one has to do with how can somebody actually find recruiters on LinkedIn? Like, where do you look? How do you connect with them? Is it easy to do it? So, uh, Kim, why don't we start with you for this question? Like, how, recruiters, how do we find them on LinkedIn? So I think, um, you know, one of the things that Kelly mentioned is, you know, when when you have that first connection, if you're going out to some of these different um, outreach events and and talking with the recruiters, well, oftentimes they will mention, you know, you'll get to know who the recruiters are, the names. We also have a lot of information on our website in terms of who the recruiters are specifically. 
So you can get those names and then therefore could do a search and look for them and, and make those connections within LinkedIn. So getting to know the recruiter online, who those people are, what positions specifically they're recruiting for, a lot of that information is available um, on the website, on the UC website. So that would be a way of getting their name and then being able to get their contact within LinkedIn and connecting there. Yeah. And even I will actually add to that. If you just go on LinkedIn and you type in, right, you know, University of California or whatever university, you can actually just search titles specifically. And all the people who have that title will show up and you can just connect with them. Kelly, do you have anything to add there? No, that's exactly right. I mean, LinkedIn, I, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with LinkedIn, but um, that system, you can find anybody that needs to find. Whatever job it is, what recruiter that, what campus their recruiter's on, LinkedIn will pop that by the way up and you can take a look and, and actually just send them an email within LinkedIn. Um, you know, they do receive quite a bit of uh, folks that are reaching out and contacting them, but it's pretty easy to do. Also on all the websites, you will, you can go to them and you look at the HR departments, you can probably find what you're saying a lot of times uh, within that. Uh, I would say one other thing though, as you guys, as everybody is alum, everybody is a recruiter that works for you see everyone is a recruiter and so every time you meet someone and and that opportunity to meet someone get to know them who they are where they work all of that is just a door into the organization um and um what we're we're, what you're about what we do um and so always remember that and use that um, as you get to know more people within you see and network uh I'm going to give Nancy you that chance to answer that question, but I just also want to say like, it's, you're right, Kelly, it's not necessarily those who have that recruiter title, the person who's only recruiting. Like, let's say, Kelly, you might know somebody, you'd be like, wait, you'd be a great person for this role or Kim or Nancy, you might, everybody's always keeping their eyes open for somebody who you think could be a great fit. So I wouldn't always be so hyper-focused on recruiter because again, it goes back to the connections. Who do you know? Nancy, do you have anything to add? And this will be actually the last question before we wrap up. Yeah, the only thing I mean, I would say is I'm always looking for talent, so I keep my business cards with me, you know, and if I'm talking to someone, I usually would say, hey, I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but you might be a good fit for the UC. Here's my business card. Call me if you're looking for a job. And that's worked for me all of my career. So, Yeah, and Nancy, I don't think recruiters in your title, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> So I hope everybody who tuned in, which, by the way, it's so fantastic that you all are here. And again, thank you to our panelists for sharing all your insight and all these tips. You know, I think sometimes the hiring process can be so frustrating, right? It's very emotional for a lot of people. You're trying, but you're not getting a cold back. So I hope everybody who tuned in today found some sort of perhaps inspiration or tips that they can use as you all are going through and maybe looking for a job, which as we know here today, the UC is a fantastic opportunity, a fantastic place to get started in your career or perhaps be your next job. So with that, I just want to say thank you. Kim, Kelly, Nancy, I, I, we appreciate you spending this afternoon with all of us here. So for those who are here and listening, I wanted to let you all know that there's going to be a survey we would love for you to share your thoughts. We look at this. This allows us to know what topics we would want to put together next. So you should be able to see it in the chat function, I believe. I believe the team behind the scenes is going to put it in there. So please click that. One other thing is we want to encourage you to join um, the You Can Network. This is the UC Advocacy Network. And also the team is going to put that link here so you can learn more about this. We also want to share that our next event is June, and this is also part of the UC Alumni Career Network. And the topic for that is going to be retiring the concept of retirement. So if there's anybody who you think would be interested in that topic of thinking about retirement, if you're in that phase, please join us for that. Thank you all again for joining, and we hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Kim, Kelly, and Nancy for spending your time with us. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.